Okay, so well, yeah, yeah, thank you very much. We think. Uh, do you have any other issue you would like to talk about? Something apart from our questions? Something else? I mentioned I mentioned earlier the question of evidence in court, mm -hmm. and this uh, accusation of first this accusation of forgery against these two archaeologists who, in my opinion, did a superb job excavating the site and should have been allowed to continue. So the question is evidence in court. So here we have a collection of over 400 artifacts, which some people claim are forgeries. That claim is based upon the fact that their interpretation of the evidence of the artifacts, or in this case the writing and graffiti and various things uh, contained on the artifacts um, is a forgery because it doesn't agree with the present known knowledge related to whatever the uh, iconography or whatever the graffiti is suggesting in, in those artifacts. Uh, this is unfortunately um, the easy way out. That is to say, if it doesn't agree with what you think or what established uh, scholarly uh, information suggests at the time, um, you don't declare it a forgery. You try and explain why this information is not in sync with pre-existing conceptions or preconceptions of uh, the period to which the artifacts relate. And I think this is a, a, a major mistake on the part of anyone, um, because you're accusing people of committing a crime instead of looking at the evidence to see why the evidence doesn't fit with uh, uh, accepted notions of vast history or whatever it might be, um, and trying then to explain how, in fact, these these pieces of pottery may expand our understanding of those periods to which they, they, they relate. The other aspect of the whole matter is the question of motive. Um, and by that, it's, it's a very simple uh, legal matter. Um, if, somebody, if somebody is murdered by someone else, the main question that the authorities ask is, what is the motive? Why did they do this? Now, they might have been insane. Uh, they, they might have been jealous lover, whatever. Uh, what is the motive? Or they killed for money. Uh, they, they, they were going to inherit the insurance policy of the estate, whatever. Motive, motive, motive. So in, in thinking of, of uh, what has happened, uh, in this particular case, um, one is at a loss to figure out what motive the archaeologist could possibly have in forging, as they're accused of, in forging 400 artifacts. What motive could they possibly have? Were they going to become the top archaeologists in the whole of Europe? Were they going to make a lot of money? Uh, what was the motive if they did it? And I think this is the question that has to be answered by the accusers. What is their motive? Are they going to become very famous archaeologists? Now, there's very little money in archaeology, as one knows, um, unless you become an Indiana Jones and can make a movie or whatever. Um, you get paid for other things. Um, so. I, I cannot understand what the motive would have been. Not only that, I'm not an expert in, in, in uh, those particular types of artifacts or the things contained within them that seem to upset some people. Um, but it all comes down to the fact that, let's say, for some reason, the motive was that they were going to become very rich or they're going to have a tough for a professorial jobs in the Basque country. Um, and even that is, you know, not necessarily a great um, 
crown to be looking for. Um, and so why would they go to the trouble of forging 400 individual things um, uh, without a motive, without a goal to achieve, knowing full well, um, if you were forging it, that the forgeries were going to upset some very powerful people and upset preconceptions about Basque history or whatever preconceptions there were that upset people enough to accuse them of forgery. So motive seems to be entirely, entirely missing. And I think a judge in the court would agree there is no motive for this. And so how can you support a, a charge of murder or forgery? The other aspect of it is reading some of the material is that these two archaeologists must be absolute geniuses. My understanding is that the range of material on these pieces of pottery is quite great. Different languages, different iconography, different, different uh, symbolism, all, all sorts of things. In other words, it wasn't all in old Latin. It was in various other things. So, um, if they did forge these, I, I think they should be given a reward because they would absolutely have to be complete and utter geniuses to make up, to forge, to make up, to invent all of these different uh, symbols and, and meanings and uh, things that lead to different interpretation of this material. So on one hand, they would have been scholars of the most utter brilliance. And at the same time, they have no motive for doing it except to bring down the whole house on top of them, which is what has happened. So it's a most curious case. Uh, forgeries in archaeology are, are not very uh, frequent, in fact, they're incredibly rare. Now, in other fields, uh, you can see that forgeries are much easier to make. I mean, if I was, if I was a brilliant... Uh, oil painter, and I could go to Madrid or wherever and uh, take a picture of uh, El Greco's painting and go to my warehouse and make a forgery. And it could look exactly like the original, except the pigments were modern and so forth, but I could make one that looks just like his painting. And uh, I would be a complete genius, as he was, whatever. Um, and um, I might get away with it. Highly unlikely, of course, because the experts would be pouncing on you to, to determine what type of canvas it was painted on, what type of pigments there were, um, uh, you know, whether there was any varnish that was of age on top of it. But the motivation is absolutely clear. I would be doing it to make money, to sell this forgery as if it was real and make a lot of money. And there have been innumerable instances of this, and they will continue, uh, because this is easy to do compared to the situation we have at hand, which is incredibly complex. There are 400 works of art that they had to fabricate. Not one, not one painting, but 400. 400 pieces of forgery. For what? If there was some great symbolic uh, act or thing to do with this type of material, they probably could have done one. But why did they do 400? I'm not saying they did. I'm just saying what is the reason for doing this, what is the intelligence and abilities to do it, and what is the motive? And I would submit to you that these two archaeologists who have been vilified out of court Prove, um, um, claimed guilty without a trial did not have the ability to do this and they had absolutely no motive whatsoever to create these forgeries. And I'm sorry to say that a number of archaeologists have rushed to judgment, as they say, to declare these things forgeries, whereas if this claim really need to be settled, it should have gone immediately to court 
and the pieces should have been subjected to all the forensic analysis necessary to try and prove that these things were done yesterday as opposed to 1,000 or 2,000 years ago. So the whole instance is, is fraught with um, improbabilities. This is so unusual um, that is to say it's too good to be true and it probably isn't. And uh, it's just a pity that in an academic world where we should uh, be able to resolve these matters without trying to destroy people's careers, um, that the situation uh, has come to pass and is now, whatever it is, five or seven years old. Um, and these two archaeologists, who in my opinion were superb excavators, which many archaeologists are not, possibly including some of the experts who are experts in artifacts, but many experts in artifacts should never be let anywhere near an archaeological site because they cannot excavate properly. And, and many of them know that and they don't excavate. Uh, but at the end of the day, I can see no motive whatsoever for this apparent crime. If it was done to advance one's career, it was totally unnecessary. One's career would advance based upon the fact that they did a superb job excavating the site, recovering the information, not bulldozing it, recovering the information, recording it so it is their posterity. In other words, they found and recorded heritage and history. They didn't dig a hole into oblivion, which many archaeologists have done in the past, and some continue to do so because they do not follow the stratigraphic method. I would also like to say that, of course, the stratigraphic method, uh, following the, the um, laying all of these things out in, in, in the little book, Principles of Archaeological Stratigraphy, which is available in Spanish and all sorts of other languages now, there's no excuse to say you didn't know. The, the, um, I lost my train of thought, sorry. That's <laughs> okay. Um, Uh, completely went out of my head. Let me just think for a second. Oh, let me put it another way around. Yeah. Since, since the late 1970s, um, we... Since the late 1970s, it is quite clear that we have our own principles of archaeological stratigraphy. And when these were laid out in the late 1970s and published in 1979, we had a great deal of uh, uh, anguish and accusations from archaeologists who uh, did, uh, did a lot of work in, in geological deposits that uh, well, this was blasphemy, that uh, uh, we were not following uh, geological methods, and so on and so on. Um, and uh, uh, I wrote this one paper on surfaces, uh, which uh, an American journal refused to publish, and one of the reviewers said I should be run out of archaeology, like Western town, run out of town, get him out of town, get rid of him because what we were suggesting did not agree with their preconceived notions. The fact of the matter is that people create stratification which is unlike, generally speaking, anything produced by geology, by Mother Nature. And uh, one of the great uh, English uh, geologists, Sir Charles Lyell, had a statement to say that, that uh, Stratification is the unbiased record of the past. And I go back to what I said earlier. No one goes out to make stratification. It's accidental. And because of that, it's unbiased. Um, and I don't know of any instances where someone has made an archaeological site and then gone and dug it up and found some artifacts and so on and so on. I mean, it's just 
this doesn't happen. It's an accidental thing. And because of that, if you record it correctly, you will have an unbiased record of the past. Not of those artifacts, but of the stratification, which is the unbiased part of it. The problem with artifacts is they can move and they can retain their integrity. If you try and move an archaeological deposit, you're going to destroy it. You may redeposit it somewhere else, but that creates a new deposit. So we uh, affirmed the fact uh, that we were changing the laws. And we were going to have our own laws for archaeological stratigraphy. And this has proved to be true, that we have a different discipline. We needed different principles in order to interpret, to excavate and interpret and record these archaeological sites than the concepts and laws that we were handed down or we borrowed from geology. So it has been a new world. And our friends who excavated at Iruna Viela did it right in the new method. They were trained in the new method. They did it right. The question of the nature of the artifacts is a whole other study where other people have to be brought to bear. But at the end of the day, no matter what the artifact specialists say, they cannot get over the fact that these objects were found at a certain, in a certain deposit in a certain place in the stratigraphic sequence um, because the archaeologists did their job stratigraphically and they did it correctly. So it's the onus of proof really rests with the accusers. And the poor archaeologists really shouldn't have to defend themselves at all. The accusers would have to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that these objects were forged, not so much from the material contained on their surfaces, but because they're able to prove forensically that these were carved 10 years ago. And of course, that's the other thing that's inexplicable in this whole business. Firstly, uh, the archaeologists would have to do the excavation. They would have to find the pieces of pottery. They would find the pieces of pottery. Then they have to decide we're going to forge the surfaces of these pieces of pottery, 400 of them. So we're going to run home to a secret laboratory we're going to get out implements of a certain type so that we can make these forgeries on the pottery. And of course, uh, we're geniuses, so, so we know about Egyptology, we know about Old Latin, we know about early Basque, I mean, we, we know everything, so we can make these forgeries. But I would submit that if you had that sort of a brain and you were a genius and all these sort of things, you wouldn't be bothered to forge anything. You'd already be one of the best professors, have the best professorial chairs in the country with all <coughs> the fame that would go with it. So, in the end, ladies and gentlemen, I can see no motive for doing this. None whatsoever. Their excavations, the look of their excavations, the way they're excavated is enough of a reward to have eventually gotten them professorships or whatever. To forge these artifacts added nothing, in my view, to the advancement of their careers. Except, of course, they perhaps should have been aware that they were going to upset people who had preconceived notions of what happened in the past and at that particular period, and that those people were going to try and destroy their careers and their life and their love of archaeology, which is, of course, the main motive that people work in archaeology because we love the profession. We love the fact that we are the ones who are capable of recovering the past through our archaeological methods. It is our profession. We are the ones who have changed the understanding of mankind in the last hundred years far more than any other profession. We are the, at the cutting edge of society, and these two archaeologists, in my view, are very fine excavators, 
and I find it terribly embarrassing uh, that uh, they have been so accused uh, in this way, particularly by other members of the profession. Okay, so thank you very much for your time. It was a very interesting 40 minutes. <laughs> oh, and, good lord. Yeah, <laughs> it was very interesting. <laughs> oh, so okay, thank you so now, much again. And yeah. Yeah. Now, you'll notice that um, uh, with this, I don't mention names. Yeah, yeah, sure. Names, uh, because, because that, that gives, gives other people, other people the opportunity to then attack you. I'm talking in generality, these people said so on and so on, whatever. But uh, so, so there we are. But, yeah, yeah. Um, I hope we can eventually resolve this matter, uh, but it, it, is, it is terrible. Anyway, well, I hope that'll, that'll do. You can edit it as down as you see fit. I'm sorry I couldn't be there, but it just uh, didn't, didn't work out. And, uh, but anyway, give my best wishes to all my friends in the Basque country. And uh, good luck. Yeah, thank you very good much for your time, Mr. Harris. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Good to see you. Cheers. Bye.